one of the fetters that ties the mind down. There's something in Pali called sila bhatta brahmasa. And many times you see it translated as attachment to rites and rituals or attachment to precepts. And I know there are not a few people out there that say, well, that's one fetter I'm not attached to. I'm not attached to rites, rituals, or precepts. I just do anything I want. That's not what the Buddha is talking about. The word sila in sila bhatta paramasa can also be translated as habit. And everybody has habits, and we're all attached to them. The question is exactly what is the problem here? Because there are some good habits that are very good to be attached to. In other words, attached in the sense of following them, sticking to them, regardless of whether they're easy or difficult. Like the five precepts, the same word, sila, and those are part of the practice. The Buddha is not recommending that you stick to them sometimes and not to other times, because there are a lot of important lessons you can learn about the mind by sticking to a precept, both when it's easy and when it's hard. It makes you more sensitive to your actions and more sensitive to the excuses the mind makes for itself when it wants to break the precept. It gives you good practice in setting a firm intention and sticking with it, which is precisely a skill you're going to need when you meditate. And it does give you practice in how to deal with times when you slip from that intention and try to get back, back on board. How to do it with a minimum of recrimination, but also a maximum of efficiency and effectiveness. Otherwise, you just don't keep dithering around saying, well, I'm learning important lessons about what it's like to break a precept. The important lessons are learned when you really sincerely try to keep to the precept. And when you ha happen to slip, then you say, okay, what can I do so I don't break it again? What's the proper attitude? In, the, in other words, rec recognizing that there was a mistake and that it did cause harm one way or another. In spite of what the mind might have told you that, well, this is a case of compassion or this is a case where there are special exemptions or whatever. The precepts are designed to be clear-cut. You notice a difference in people's attitude is if they say they're hard and fast, they usually say, well, the precepts aren't hard and fast, as if that was something negative. But they're clear-cut because you need clear-cut guidelines. Just ask anyone who's raised a child if the laws you lay down for the child are open to constant negotiation and pushing back and forth. The child may like it in the short term, but not in the long term. It gets very confusing. It's a lot easier to live by something that's clear-cut and not open to negotiation. So you learn important rules about how to live with a clear-cut rule like that, and how to get better and better at holding to it. Because having some clear-cut rules in your life Make it a lot easier to figure out when something's going wrong in your meditation, why it's going wrong. It's like being a scientist. You try to minimize the variables that the things you're studying are subject to. So you can focus on, okay, where is the real problem here? And the precepts close off a lot of unskillful variables in your life so that you can focus on the ones that are happening in the mind right here, right now, and not have to deal with the added problems of remorse over a slip in the precepts or remorse in a time when you've harmed somebody. So when the Buddha is talking about letting go of your attachment to precepts, what's he talking about? Well, there's a passage in the canon where he says that you still hold to the precepts, but you don't make yourself around them. You don't fashion yourself around them. In other words, they don't become part of your pride and identity. 
in the sense that I'm proud because I can hold to this precept, but other people around there can't. That's the point where the precept becomes a problem. But if the precept itself is not the problem, it's your attitude toward that precept, or the attitude toward the fact that you can hold to it and other people can't. That's the problem. There's a famous story about a John Mahabhu and a John Mun, where John Mahabhu was taking on various ascetic practices, and, and John Mun could see there was there was some pride in them. One of the practices he was holding to was of not accepting any food that came after the alms round. And so maybe once or twice during the rains retreat, John Mun would pass by a John Mahabhu's bowl and just suddenly slip something into the bowl. Of course, if anybody else had done that, a John Mahabhu would have yelled at them, but here was a John Mun. So I had to accept it. And reflect on the fact that yes, he was getting a little prideful around the precept, or around the practice that he had taken on. And we can misread that and think, well, that's another excuse for learning to be lax or easygoing about the precepts, or about whatever special practices you take on to control your defilements. No, he's not saying to be lax. He's saying to look at the pride and realize that the pride is a problem, but the practice itself is not. I mean, it teaches you lots of good things. The ascetic practices are very good for showing up your defilements, so you can deal with them directly. In fact, nowadays the pride tends to be on the other, other side. People say, well, I'm above precepts, I'm above practices, I'm above Sunday school rules. There's a lot of pride in that. A while back I read a piece by a supposed Dharma teacher who's has a reputation for having had adulterous affairs, and saying these monks in the Thai forest tradition are horrible, the way they treat women. They don't touch them. And it's really bad for the women not to be touched, somehow. And so here's a person you know, blatantly breaking the precepts, been proud of the fact that he's breaking the precepts and looking down at people who hold to them. Now that's where our society has gotten these days. That's where the pride is. And so we really need to take the precepts seriously, that they are means for controlling all kinds of unskillful attitudes. And the pride that comes from learning how to do that is a much less vicious, much less destructive problem than the problems that are caused by breaking the precepts. And even if it's, say, one of the ascetic practices where if you break it you're not harming anybody, still there's that question about your dialogue in your own mind. Why is it that that particular practice got dropped? What was the reasoning? What was the excuse? What was the rationalization? Was it a matter of defilement or not? And having taken on that practice throws a lot of these things into sharp relief. So it's the pride that's the problem, not the precept. The other case where the attachment is, is bad is when you think that by simply by following the precepts, that in and of itself makes you a better person or accomplishes the goal. And again, the precepts are part of the path, but they're not the goal. When you reach the deathless, you realize, okay, holding the precepts was very helpful. But the goal itself is something else entirely. That's why the Buddha had that riddle of the farmer who was offering his daughter to the Buddha. And after the Buddha re rejected the daughter, the farmer asked him, what is this goal you're practicing that's better than my daughter? And the Buddha said, it's not defined by precepts, in terms of precepts or knowledge, but it can't be t attained without precepts or knowledge. Now, the way he stated it in Pali was a play of words in the different cases of the nouns, because when you say it's not defined by it, it can also sound like it, well, it's not attained through the means of. 
the precepts of the knowledge. And then he goes around to say that, of course, you can't attain it without precepts and knowledge. So the farmer misheard it. Said it sounded like nonsense. But the point the Buddha was making is that this goal is not defined as a as a particular precept or a particular habit. The habits get you there, but then once you've gotten there, then the goal itself goes beyond them. That's the kind of attachment, the idea that somehow the precepts constitute the goal. That's something that's abandoned. In fact, that's the fetter that's abandoned, that's stream entry. So the problem is not with the precepts, they're actually extremely helpful. And as I said, the issue about pride around the precepts nowadays has very little to do with the fact that you can hold to them. And it's more the idea of why that you feel that you're above them. You don't need to stoop to those things. Well, it's, it's a really good lesson in humility to learn to place your actions under the, under the structure of the precepts. And not just in humility, you learn a lot about your own defilements that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. So as the Buddha said, when you get beyond skillful habits, it's not the fact that you start engaging in unskillful habits. Getting beyond the skillful habits means that you've seen something that goes beyond them, but you still hold to them. In fact, you're even more firm in holding them because you've seen how harmful it is to break the precepts and how helpful it is to hold to them. It's simply you don't define yourself around them. So that's the issue we're going to work on, is this tendency to define ourselves around them. Either that we're above the precepts or that we're better than other people because of the precepts we hold to. And one good way to think about it is to remind yourself it's like medicine. You're in a hospital, you're taking your medicine, the person in the bed next to you is not taking his medicine. The fact that you're a dutiful patient doesn't make you better than the other person. The fact that he's not taking his medicine doesn't mean he's better than you. That is not an issue of who's better than the other person. The fact is you're taking the medicine and you're making it more likely that you are going to be healed. And the comparison with the other person is totally irrelevant. So when you look at the precepts and the other ascetic practices as a form of medicine, that minimizes the danger around them. You're taking them not because you want to show off to other people or that you want to pride yourself how much better you are. It's simply a matter you realize you've got some defilements, and they have sneaky ways in your mind, and you want to be able to ferret them out so you don't get fooled by them. And the precepts help draw some lines, so you know when the mind steps over the lines there's a problem. It alerts you that there's something needs to be done. And when you can take that attitude of the precepts, there's no problem with them at all. <laughs>